Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. Welcome back to the Prog Talks, everyone. Once again with me, Uncle Prog. Before we go into the interview, I want to mention quickly in the description, we have this buy us a coffee link if you want to, you know, support us a little bit. But with that out of the way, I'm very excited today to introduce my guests. One of my favorite musicians, Toby Driver from KO Dot, Maudlin of the Well, and so many other bands and projects. How are you doing, Toby? Good. Hello, Grun. Yeah, let's just get right into it. You know, it's the 20th anniversary of Bath and Leaving Your Body Map, two mm-hmm. seminal Maudlin of the Well albums. Personally, I bought them when they were released in 2001. Uh, I saw the cover art and the f- fascinating fact that these were like two connected albums. Mm-hmm. And I also, of course, it wasn't a total blind buy because I also mm-hmm. knew some of the bands on Dark Symphonies, the, the label. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, so can you tell me a little bit about the work on those albums back then? I believe mm. they were both a mix of material that was quite old at the point where you released released the album, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, Model of the Well started in 1996. So it's now the 25th anniversary of that too, of which is pretty cool. Well, yeah. yeah, and uh, and we uh, just made demos for a few years. Mm. And, uh, and um, around 1999, uh, I think that the band had we had pretty much decided that we weren't really going to do much else by that point because mm. um because really the the original modern of the well lineup was uh these these two friends of mine from high school uh in my hometown Greg Massey and Jason Byron yeah and we we made these tapes uh you know in our in our hometown and uh and then we went off to college and you know none of us lived in the same state anymore so we were we were separated and i was at school and um so it was almost like mall of the well existed just in this demo form as this thing we i did with my friends and then i was kind of like moving on to my my college yeah, music studies and uh and the internet was kind of new at the time and making GeoCities pages and things like that. So, uh, you know, I had like a really old version of Photoshop somehow. And, uh, you know, and I made a few graphics and I made a GeoCities page and I put a real audio player of some of those Modern of the World demos yeah. up on there. And I forgot about it for a, like a year or so. And uh, and I don't really know how these labels found it, but somehow the labels found it, and it could have hmm. been because it was in the music section of GeoCities or something like that. But um, the first label that came to us was The End Records, and they had, oh. um, yeah, and, and and he had just kind of found our page and uh, and kind of you know offered offered to put out our one of our demos you know like our, our record yeah, yeah. our demo record on the end and um and i was really interested and he and he sent me a contract and um seemed cool but then uh the only reason we didn't do it is because he wanted us to re-record the entire thing wow. and uh and i had already spent like a whole year making that and i was just like i am not going to re-record this yeah. like this this thing is is the statement you know i i can't i can't imagine myself re-recording these songs yeah. Just doing all that work again, yeah. so uh, so that's why we just didn't do that. And then it kind of sat on that web page, uh, maybe for what felt like another year. I for, I totally forgot about it, and then got an email out of nowhere from Dark Symphony saying, you know, we want to release this, and um, they didn't want us to re-record it. <laughs> so I was like, totally, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, so um, so basically, they released. You know, we made a selection of kind of like our favorite tracks from the mm. demos, and um, and they released um. A collection of those, and that was the first model of the well album in 1999. It was called My Fruit Cycle Bells. Cycle Bell, yeah, 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 yeah. And and really, like, we didn't re- have to re record anything. All that, all that we did was we went into a pro studio and, and the engineer kind of did a little bit of remixing. I see, but yeah. um, 
That's yeah, but old. really, really n- not much else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and then um, and then after after that one came out, uh, the label was going to allow us to kind of like do a, a fully studio supported album. You know, record record everything in the in the professional studio, and they were going to pay for it. So that's when we took a lot of our other songs that were on the demos because we had like five demo tapes at mm-hmm. that point. So we had a lot of songs. We took a lot of those songs, our favorite ones, and maybe there were a few new ones. All the kind of like acoustic interludes and stuff are all new, and um, you know, and, and we like yeah, we took we had a lot of material. Like I said, there were yeah. there were like five demos, which is why there's there's twenty songs on those, and yeah, and we were able to record everything in, in a good context, and that was pretty exciting. So I would even say that the 1999 album, My Fruit Psychobells, is not really an album because it's hmm. just demos. It's a demo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, and like I've, I've never, I've never really felt happy with the mm. way that sounds or anything like that. It just to me feels like a demo. So it's like Bath and Leaving Your Body Map are, are really like the the only Mother of the Well album until yeah, the, until the reunion one. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Well, well, of you know, maybe the 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 end records were right in that you should have, if not re-recorded, then at least that it wasn't oh. yeah good enough for. Uh, yeah, I know. yeah, but I think about in- that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting yeah, I, to it, it's interesting to hear that with the end records because I think you guys would have fit well onto that label as well with some of the other bands that were on there at yeah. that time, like you know Argalock. <laughs> and yeah, you, yeah, it it would have yeah. been yeah a good label for you as well. Yeah, I mean, I was like eighteen years old, nineteen years old at the time, mm-hmm. so of course, I you know I was not capable of making a decision. No. A, a wise decision <laughs> but no it's fine it worked out fine <laughs> yeah it did it, uh, you, you know yeah. uh, going back to that uh my fruit psycho bell and 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 uh what was sort of your musical goals when you guys started up modeling of the well what were what what were sort of the musical landscapers you were operating in or inspired by oh. yeah well um you know i um i was really into uh like new age music that's kind of like really synthesizer hmm. based stuff and uh, and so was Jason Byron the lyricist um you know he really liked tangerine dream oh. and um and um i wasn't super into tangerine dream but i i had other ones that i that i really loved a lot and uh, and then we liked metal and um uh, at some point in the mid 90s we discovered that there were a couple bands that were blending metal with synthy keyboards but not in a kind of like proggy dream theater way and more yeah. in like a kind of in kind of like a atmospheric way and when we discovered these bands i think like you know tiamat was was one of the most important ones yeah. and um and uh, i i love disembowelment and i don't know if you mm. if you know this this record transcendence into peripheral yeah, but I do. um yeah but yeah, it's really amazing if you read the the liner notes in that they in their thanks list they thank all of the new age artists that I liked at the time. So ah. it's like, oh my god, this band also <laughs> was thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. So we were really excited to mix kind of doomy metal with um, with just atmospheric stuff. Yeah. And um, and you know just because like I'm kind of a, a music nerd, I uh, I always kind of wanted to try to get more and more and more. Uh, technical and more complex, and yes. you know, I was I was listening I was listening to bands like Atheist and stuff at the time. So, um, you know, I kind of wanted to inject some kind of like technicality to it yeah. as a as a educated musician, but also then have the atmosphere and stuff like that. And that's yeah. kind of that's kind of what we were trying to do with with Model of the World. Yeah, I, I think mm-hmm. that's probably also why it it uh, sort of spoke to me so much because just like you, I, I was a big fan of you know. Cynic and atheist, and you know those early technical death metal albums. But at the same time, mm. like you know, you mentioning uh, Tiamat's Wild Honey, and you know stuff like mm-hmm. that, and that atmospheric right. psychedelic stuff, and it came together in Modlin of, of the Well, right? So, yeah, yeah, and, and uh, um, I don't know if you want to jump ahead so much right now, but but I I, I guess I would just say with the new Kaodad album, Mosquero yeah, and the go, Swords go of Plowshares, like. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a it's it's kind of like another um, another attempt at that. Yeah, that's, you know, um, yeah. Be, I've been yeah, lucky because enough. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say because I you know Kodot has diverged so much into these other paths, um, and I and I haven't really engaged with um, this thing that I was just talking to you about, like mm. this kind of like mixing of of new age and in in, in, in like 
basically European metal yeah. um, in such a deliberate way. And so with, with this new record, since it's the Modern Lowell anniversary, it's kind of like, yeah, let's, let's, let's um, explore this, uh, this intention again. And, you know, and, and now that I'm in my 40s, now I can do it in a more sophisticated way than you would hear 20 years ago <laughs> in Model of the Well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I've been lucky enough, like I, I was supposed to say, to to listen to the new album f- for a, a while with the promo. And I have to say, it's it's uh, I really, really enjoy it. And it's clear to me that you are sort of revisiting some of that territory that you sort of were on the same uh, the same same stuff as as with modeling of the well so you know cool. uh, i i i wanted to to ask about um the I, i've always wondered were there ever like an a thought to package these two albums into like a double album or like make up yeah you know when um, you release y- them you know i i i cannot tell you why we didn't do that i i just don't know why we didn't because oh. we could have, <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah I, I can't remember why. I mean, there must have been a reason, but maybe maybe the label thought it was cooler to do it separate, or we thought it was cooler. But I don't really know. Well, and, I mean, Model, Model of the Well was really into secrets and mystery. Yeah, and I think that I think that we probably really liked the idea that if you only got one of those, um, you would really have this feeling that you were missing something. Mm. And you and you would have to you would have to kind of like explore within yourself like why do I feel like there's some mystery that I'm not understanding and then you would have to seek out the answer to this and then you would discover that there's another mirror version <laughs> of the record. Well, that's interesting <laughs> and, because uh, yeah. you know it sort of felt like that when you bought those albums you either had to buy them together or you had to get the other one at some point and 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 these secrets you're talking about is is really something I had here on my next question, you know, it's hinted at mm. in the liner notes and everything, you know, and even, but even after this, uh, the secret song that you added with the re-release, I feel like the riddle, the secrets, they never really, it never really got solved or anything. I, of course, I'm not going to ask you <laughs> for, uh, to, to, you know, spell out what this, this is, but what were sort of the philosophies behind putting this, things into your music and into your art and well well you you can ask that because because recently this year um th- there was this uh this guy who's a fan of us and he and he made his own youtube video where he explores the solution to this and um and he excuse me <laughs> and he put it up on youtube a few months ago and yeah and um and you know he did a really great job and um and then he comes to this one point in the solution where um you know, after having followed everything correctly, then there's this one thing that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you know, now that, now that every, you know, the internet, like we can, we're so connected. He just like straight up asked me, he's like, can you help me with this? And I said, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I don't think I can help you with this I, because, because it looks like you're doing everything right. Yeah. And so then I asked Jason Byron, you know, our lyricist and as the lyricist, he kind of was, was the one that was in charge of kind of creating this, cypher yeah and um and i asked him and i was like i was like hey you know this looks right and i remember when we were when we were putting this together you were very 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 careful about it and it worked mm-hmm. at the time so we're like why is it not working now and um and he couldn't remember it because it's just been too long ago so yeah. now there's like there's this one there's this one element to the puzzle that that none of us know how to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's sort of like uh, that's sort of like uh, poetic justice, right? At at, yeah. it, at this point, not even you guys are able to solve that riddle you made back in the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's very very close. Like, yeah, it's it's yeah. super super close. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, since like I said, we were we were kids at the time that we yeah. made this. So, so the things that we're influenced by is basically like. You know, Final Fantasy, mm. and um, and uh, a lot of movies that we loved, and um, um, you know, literature, but uh, and like the Kabbalah, and just but all this stuff that yes. all this stuff that really only like a like a nineteen year old would understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's, yeah. it's not like the it's not like the deepest level of sophistication. It's like no. definitely like children. No, yeah. Well, I, I, I sort of understand where you're coming from. I think I, I had sort of the same mindset when I was 
that that age, you know, and everything yeah. seems like um, at least superficially very like interesting and, and fascinating to you. But maybe you don't go to the depths where you would do and sort of understand the core of it like you would when you're a bit older. So, right. but, but mm-hmm. uh, I guess that's also why uh, a, a big reason why those albums fascinated me so much back then, you mm-hmm. know. It feels like a lot changed between uh, My Fruit Psycho Bell and, and Bath and Body Map. For instance, the, I felt like the instruments, the flute, clarinet, viola, trumpet seemed to take up more room uh, on, mm-hmm. on, on the, the later albums. Uh, mm-hmm. What can you tell me about the inclusion of those musicians like Jason Bittner, Terran Olson? What did they contribute mm-hmm. to those two albums? Well, uh, Terran Terran um, has been uh, a super important contributor for KO Dot, and then and yeah. uh, sorry for Model of Little and the KO Dot albums that he's exactly. that yeah. he's been on. And since he's a since he's a woodwind and keyboard player, and he doesn't play any guitar. Um, you know, he always um, his contribution always was just more along like the kind of like horns and mm. um, and keyboard stuff, and um, and uh, he he always like added a lot. He wrote his own parts, and he wrote uh, horn sections for uh, the all the horn players that were on yeah. Cars of the Eye and things like that. Like yeah, when we were when we were kind of like assigning, uh, you know, whose responsibilities were in the band. Uh, Taryn, Taryn was always responsible for the the woodwind stuff, and then I was always responsible for like the violins and strings and stuff like that. Yeah. And we we kind of split it up that way. Um, yeah, but he's like his contributions are amazing. He's a great musician, and uh, you know, and he can play multiple horns. So mm-hmm. whenever 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 we needed to do something, he could he, he could, could do a lot of it himself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, it's really great. Yeah, I, I really wish that I could uh, play with him again. You know, but we live like. On totally opposite sides of the country, well, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a big country, so it's not it's not easy yeah. to to yeah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, going back to that that or talking in general about that era of music, you know, uh, you mentioned like mm-hmm. European metal, right? And mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, uh, if you if you look at that, I feel like that towards the end of the nineties, a lot of those bands, My Dying Bride released The Angel and the Dark River, like Gods of the Sun, Tiamat yeah. released Wild Honey, like you. You, you mentioned In the Woods turned from black metal into some kind of psychedelic avant-garde band. Same with Ulvedi, yeah. you know, Ulvedi changed from a black metal band into, yeah, electronic, whatever, you know, some kind of yeah. weird, you know. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me like when uh, a Bath and a Body Map was released, then that sort of thing was, if not fizzling out, then some of those bands had either sort of started to return to their original state or they had mm-hmm. sort of changed completely or even disappeared you know mm. did this this era have uh, a lot of influence on the music you were creating did you sort of have an interest in this era of uh, of uh, european metal absolutely i mean um yeah and, and actually it was um I, I i ended up being really disappointed with a lot of the backpedaling that a lot of those bands did yeah um and um and it, it you know one of one of the like you know i mean i i always was a big fan of my dying bride but but i loved the one called 34.788% oh, complete yeah. i thought it was amazing and i was so happy that they were doing that and then um and then after that one came out and the fan response wasn't very good i remember reading some interviews with the band that that said that they regretted making that yeah. and that it was a mistake and then and then you know, and then Calvin Robert Shaw left the band after that, and uh, and then the very next one, they kind of like tried to go back to their roots, and they did, I was yeah. like, man, this is this is this is bumming me out because <laughs> that's that's like, I, I, man, I, I don't want to like say anything negative about them. I just I just thought that that was like a shock to me yeah, that they yeah I, that I, they I, that they ap- apologize for like a, a creative choice that they made, you know, um, so. Um, you know, because like that kind of thing was happening, I guess I I kind of felt like that if the scene wasn't really going to embrace experimentation in that way, mm. then maybe that wasn't really like the right type of scene for me. Exactly. Um, and uh, and I I really stopped listening to a lot of that music 
uh, for a lot of years. And I'm talking about like probably after 2001. Like, yeah, like after Beth and Leave Your, your yeah. Body Map. Yeah. Um, but I, but I did love, um, you know, I loved that My Dying Bride record. I loved Alternative Four by Nathma. I loved mm. uh, Themes from William Blake by Over, you know, uh, I, all of the Omnio by In the Woods, all of those that came out around then. Fantastic, like, yeah. I thought they were so, so, so great. And I, um, yeah, and I, I would have, I would have loved to kind of like continue to pay attention to that kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I think you're you're right on there that a lot of these bands either sort of had to find a new audience or you know disband or you know even like you say backpedal a bit to be able mm-hmm. to continue doing what they wanted to do and and of course that's that's uh, I don't I don't like that either uh, as someone who heard from all my friends that you know this album isn't very good and that album isn't very good. And for me, it was some of the best stuff they had released. I was Mm. surprised, but at the same time, I wasn't surprised because of course, a lot of people Mm. just wanted them to make like the same album over and over again. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I felt like for, for you guys, then going into K.O. Dot after, after, um, uh, Maudlin sort of shut down, then Mm. you sort of explored, another territory another scene another right yeah and and that that goes very closely along with the thing that we were just talking about too and um and the way that um the way that like experimentation and kind of uh going beyond what was expected from metal um was not super understood in the scene Oh. Um, so, um, I, you know, when we were working on the very first KO dot record, it actually was a model of the well record and we were, oh, yeah. we were going to, we were going to release it as model of the well with dark symphonies. Yeah. And, um, and at some point throughout the process, you know, after we were almost done with the record and we sent the demos to dark symphonies and like, they weren't really totally enthusiastic about it and they weren't really supporting us finishing the record and they, they they weren't you know they weren't really like giving us the enthusiasm that we needed for that and i was like man um i was like if this record comes out in the scene dark symphony was was so specifically like a mm. kind of like gothic gothic metal label i was like if it, if this yeah. just comes out as like a gothic metal record it's going to get lost and um you know no one's going to care about exactly, it exactly yeah and and it made a lot more sense to move over to kind of like more experimental situation that mm. that didn't really have the um, the baggage of of the uh, <laughs> the rules and expectations of yes of yeah. uh, of metal in that way yeah yeah you know let's talk a little bit of the, about the the new album you know I, mm-hmm. I find it very good uh, and uh, is is quite a bit different than blasphemy which was mm. probably my favorite release from 2019 but it's oh, still amazing. very much like unmistakably you. Uh, it feels like there's been a slow drift back to a more metalized sound uh, on Plastic House and to Blasphemy and now the new album. Um, mm. So what was the uh, creative process like creating Mosgrew on Swords and Plowshares alike? And what led you sort of back to this sound? Um, what, well, what led me back to the sound was, I think, the anniversary of Model of the Well. Yeah. Um, uh, and secondly, um, the fact that we're working with Prophecy now. Um, so, you know, we had, KO. I had this experience back in 2008 when we, uh, 2007, 2008, we signed to Hydrahead. Yeah. And um, Hydrahead was like a pretty big indie at the time. And, um, you know, and then the, the first record I gave them was like this non-metal woodwind uh, thing, you know, and, um, and, you know, uh, Aaron Turner, like that guy that runs a label, he was he was happy about the record. He thought yeah. it was cool, but their audience did not accept that record. And um, and then the, the next record we did for Hydrahead was Coyote, which was like all like kind of like goth yes, fusion and like exactly. and like not metal. So um, so and, and then we did Stained Glass for Hydrahead, which is like this long form, like you know. Anyway, so <laughs> we didn't do any we didn't do any heavy heavy records for no, Hydrahead, no. and they're a heavy label. Yeah. And um and when I and we we you know we like we failed badly, you know, <laughs> with our with our career at that time. <laughs> and um and I guess I would say that I, you know, in hindsight, I kind of regret not trying to fit into that label's audience better. Mm. 
Um, you know, it's not that I'm it's not that I'm apologizing for the work. No. You know, like in this thirty four point seven eight percent complete thing, I'm I'm not apologizing for the work, but I think that as a career choice, it might have made more sense to pay more attention to who their audience was. Yeah. And um, and so now that we're in prophecy, um, I'm I am like deliberately paying attention to their scene, and yeah. I, you know, I'm not I don't think I'm gonna try to make a super like avant garde non metal like woodwind record for prophecy. <laughs> oh, I see. You know, it's it's not like yeah. you know you're you're. It's not like you're creating music that you think the fans will like, but it's more like being you know conscious of what kind of what the label has to offer yeah. you as a music, musician, right, and a band, and yeah, 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 yeah. uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I, th- I mean, it is a partnership in a way, and I don't want to just be uh, like totally oblivious to mm. their role, you know, because it matters. Well, it's clear to me, at least, that this mm. this album f- uh, fits very well into the catalog of, of Prophecy, and uh, mm, I, th- I think that's something that uh, hopefully you guys will it, it will benefit you in a way that you can sort of get. Uh, Thank bigger, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Hope, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know. I, I also know that you toured, uh, and that surprised me. You know, when I did research for this, I, you know, I know quite a bit about you and your music because I've been a fan for so long. But I hadn't picked up on the fact that you toured with Mirkud, and that yes. you, yeah. And I, I wonder was how did that come about? What was the experience like? And did it influence this mm. change in some way? Also, um, well, it came about because. Um, uh, the guy that produced her record, um, Mirite, Mir- I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry, but the um, uh, but the one that, like, her last big metal record, that one yeah. that, that got, like, record of the year on Metal Hammer and stuff, um, Mir- Mirite did, <laughs> I'm so sorry, oh, <laughs> it means nightmare. Uh, did it, yes. It? did it, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one, yeah. yeah. Um, the guy that produced that record is Randall Dunn, and he did, he produced a lot of KO.Dot records. Oh. And, so since Randall and I are friends, um, and she needed a she needed an American backing band for some American course, shows she yeah. was doing because she didn't want to like get visas for her European band. Mm. Um, so we kind of like you know we stepped into me and actually like the guitarist of Kyoto at the time, Ron Ver- Verode. We yeah. we both stepped in, and the drummer from Artificial Brain was the drummer, uh, and we did her, her American shows and we did a few European shows. I guess we did, yeah, we did two European tours and we mm-hmm. did one American tour and we did a some fest. So, um, yeah, it was just because of, of Randall and his hookup. I and, see. uh, yeah, it was a cool experience and, and, and it actually did influence this, um, this, these decisions that I'm making now because coincidentally, KO dot signed to prophecy right at the same time that I started doing this with Mirror Crew. And, um, and we we did these European tours, and we, and one of the tours was with Solstafir, yes, and um, and Oceans of Slumber, who are American, but yep. you know, then we then like at one of the shows, like you know, one of the guys from My Dying Bride came, and, and I was like, and I was seeing that there were like a lot of people at these shows in this kind of like style of music that I had forgotten about yeah. for fifteen years, and I was like, wow, man, this scene is really really alive here is, yeah. and even though even though nobody in the united states really cares at all about european gothic metal mm. um in europe it was like a lot very very alive and and i was like wow this is i'm, I'm actually like kind of in, in contact with people that were were characters from my from my childhood you know um ah, yeah. and people people that like were, were like these kind of like di- very distant almost mythical musicians yeah. that I thought I would never cross paths with now I'm in the same spot as them and uh and I was like oh this is very real and what a coincidence that you know that now we're on prophecy and we have the opportunity to kind of like participate in this and um the fact that I actually even know some of them personally now mm. and it's like yeah I actually can participate whereas you know like I'm saying 20 years ago I, I never felt like you it was mortal. related to my actual life no. yeah yeah, mm-hmm. um, well, I I can see how that was sort of both helpful and in, inspiring, and I guess yeah. what you're saying as well about the European scene, you know, not only with the the gothic atmospheric stuff, but also with like black gaze and stuff like that is like very prevalent here, and I mm-hmm. I see it when I l- like interview American um, musicians even that sometimes there's a different, you know, when we talk about prog metal, it means something different to them than it does to me or to some European 
fans yeah. or yeah it's like uh, maybe i don't i wouldn't say like bro like bigger or broader but like a lot of experimental or avant-garde bands sort of go under the progressive label here while in the mm. u.s it's more like you know your your dream theaters or your you know this kind of is is thought of as as prog right yeah i i actually i i actually would say that i don't have any relationship with what's considered to be progressive metal no. in america yeah. um I have, I have no relationship to it and i and i don't listen to those bands and I've, I've tried, you know, I've checked them out, but it's just not really my thing. It's, oh, it's exactly, like, yeah. but yeah, if, you, if I was going to think about like progressive metal that I, that I like, I mean, you know, there's a span on prophecy called a forest of stars that I oh, think is fantastic. really awesome yeah, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, like more, more spooky, yeah. but creative ideas. And yeah. that, that's the kind of music that I have no, uh, you know, qualms about calling a progressive metal band or having progressive elements but for a lot of american fans that falls outside of the progressive metal sort of uh, yeah right so yeah because because for american for americans that of a of a younger generation for them prog or progressive means um like over the top technicality yeah yeah and um and i i don't think that that's what prog is no I think I think that's just technical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yeah. I, I think you know. Uh, luckily, I think also with younger fans now, it is sort of changing because bands like Leprous and stuff they were sort of getting you know they have a, a different scope on what's prog and they're more and yeah. more being real you know talked about as progressive rock or progressive yeah. metal. So I think there's a positive you know uh, mm-hmm. development there as well. But in general, I think you're right, especially during the. 90s and 2000s it was like synonymous with you know dream theater and that type of mm-hmm. yeah yeah if you are enjoying this interview please head over to theprogspace.com for more reviews articles pictures and interviews all about progressive music you can also find us on facebook twitter and instagram theprogspace.com You know, yeah. um, uh, the link back to Maudlin of the Well is, of course, very strong with Moss, Gruon, Swords, and Plow shares alike, since you once again work with Greg Massey and Jason Byron. What right. can you tell me about their involvement with the new album? Yeah, their, their involvement with the new album was pretty much exactly the same as it was with the, the first Maudlin of the Well tape. Yeah. Um, whereas Greg recorded solos, guitar solos, and you know, Jason Byron did did lyrics, and it, the only thing that's different is that he didn't do vocals yeah. this time. Um, and he he, um, he just uh, you know we've talked about it a bunch of times. He he doesn't really consider himself to be a performer or a musician. He's more into just writing. Yeah. So yeah, and then everything else, you know, I played just just like back in the day. You know, I played uh, on the first Mile the Well tape. I played like guitar, keyboard, drums, everything. Stuff, oh, so. yeah. Yeah. And and then Greg, yeah, Greg just did the solos. I even played clarinet back in the day too, but I don't really do that so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I think, you know, uh, I, I found, found uh, of course, I haven't had the chance to look at lyrics or anything, but, but you know, the, the press, what the press release talked about, you know, as a Norwegian, I'm of course familiar with like the cyclic nature of Norse mythology, something mm. that's referenced on the album. Uh, contrasted mm. with the like finite life found in you know the monotheistic religions, mm. could you tell me a little bit about the philosophies or the themes that's explored on this new album? Yeah, and uh, and I have to say, you know, I I'm not the lyric writer, so I'm just going to be no, I'm giving you my of interpretation yeah, yeah. of it. Yeah, um, but I guess um, you know, a, you know, as I'm as I'm kind of like performing these lyrics and, and working them into my music and everything like that, I, I definitely have to study them and try to understand them in some way so that I can feel what I'm singing. Mm, and of so I, I'm kind of understanding about this music that, um, you know, he's, he's saying that, um, you know, there, there's all this imagery of striving to be a hero. Yeah. And, um, and then the idea of the hero actually failing and uh you know because because so much of the time when we when we read stories um the heroes the heroes don't fail no. you know the heroes the heroes always somehow succeed and um 
you know, going back to kind of the, some of the stuff you were asking me about Model of the Well and like the, yeah. the clues and the liner notes. And I said that it was influenced mm-hmm. by like cinema, like the movies we liked and video games. That there one element that is like that in these lyrics is that if you ever saw the movie, The Never Ending Story, yes, of course. Um, there's this one scene where Atreyu watches from a distance as this knight tries to go through the this gate where there's these these two angel statues in the, in yeah. the night. He, you know, he goes to the statues and and as they're, what they're saying in the story is like, if the knight feels any fear, then the angels, then their eyes will open, yeah, and they destroy and they destroy him. Destroy and down. so the knight, yeah, and so the knight is kind of like going through this gate, and um, you see the eyes start to open, and he gets destroyed, and uh, and if you can just kind of think about how he is being heroic, but obviously the thing that killed him was the fact that he's actually like really terrified. And yeah. um, so uh, I think that that's, that's kind of like a lot of the, the kind of um, feeling of this record mm. that, well, you know, there, there's, there's like failure to be a hero and it's based on your fear and your frailty and mm. things like that. Well, I, I, I find that interesting, fascinating, you know, uh, as I'm sitting here in France doing the interview, uh, my closest neighbor building is, is called the Commanderie. And it was the mm. headquarters of the Knight Templars in this area. Mm. And, the, and, wow. the first, and the first two tracks on the album, the Knight, Knight Errant and the mm-hmm. Brethren of the Cross sort of, you know, made me think <laughs> about, you know, Christianity, you know, the Knights, everything. Uh, yeah. religion uh, you know i know i know uh, jason is the one who does the lyrics but is there some yeah. kind of if not criticism then at least some kind of discussion on the meaning of religion on the album or um i, I i'm not so sh- really sure that i can answer that question hmm. um because e- even the title of the album is a biblical reference yes so and i know that byron you know thinks very deeply about everything he's writing so um as, uh, you know, he as as part of his like m- one of his major pursuits in his life is that he um, he's kind of like an autodidactic theologian. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, he's he's kind of constructed his own uh, philosophy of of um, of religion and and occultism and just a system that that works for his worldview yeah. based on his, based on like many years of, of studying all that stuff and be, being a member of the Freemasons and the OTO and all of these things that he's gone through. And then he's kind of come to this point where he has his own um, mythos, I guess it's not really mythos. I don't think there are any gods, but it's like, you know, it's this system that yeah, he has. It's, yeah. It's a, and, the, the, mm. yeah. It's, and, and, um, and yeah, there's definitely something in there that's related to, um, his background as growing up as a Catholic, just like just like me, you know, like to, he and I, we grew up together, and we mm-hmm. we had to, you know, our families were Catholic. We we, we actually met at Catholic school, so yeah. I think there's like <laughs> some of that that's like never going to go away. Well, of for course, him. yeah, um, huh. yeah. Um, and uh, and I told him I was like I was like you know I, I've been trying to kind of um not contextualize my life based on religion and not even being opposed to religion. I just, I just don't really want to contextualize my life that way. So, um, so things like religious imagery and in, in music are something that I've been trying to kind of like, you know, kind of get away from myself. Yeah. But, um, but it's very much in his, uh, front of his mind right now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think there's something going on there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, you know you say you know you, you've been trying to something I can understand very well. You know, like uh, remove remove it some somewhat from your life or whatever, but it keeps creeping yeah. in. You know, the last album is called Blasphemy. It's, you can't get <laughs> more yeah related than that. So so I think it's like yeah. it it there's there's something there, right? And and it's fascinating uh, in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think I think. Um, yeah, he. I'm sure he's done a lot of like self examination about it. But yeah, it'd be really interesting to talk to him about like you know why why do you think about this so much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this album will be the second one released on on Prophecy, right? So uh, and mm-hmm. before that, with Coffins uh, on IO and Plastic House, you were with mm-hmm. the Flenser. So yeah. uh, what prompted you to go with Prophecy? And you know what's the experience been like working with them? Mm. Well, that was actually uh, the Flenser's idea to do that. Oh, really? And yeah. Um, yeah, and and I was kind of talking to the Flenser about about doing another record, and um, 
and we needed we needed like a, a big recording advance. I mean, not big, not big as far as bands go, but no, big no. for us. Yeah, recording advance, and uh, and the Flanzer really, like couldn't really provide one, and uh, and so I was like, well, I can't really, you know, I I as a musician in New York City, I'm like always broke, so I, I you know, it's not like I have money to pay up front for a record. Um, so it was like, yeah, making a record is basically impossible unless we get an advance, mm. and. Um, Flanzer couldn't do it. So it was like, yeah, it's kind of necessary to find someone else. And he said, well, you know, Prophecy, uh, they're, they basically just um, established themselves in the US and they're, they're basically doing this big signing where they're, they're, they're basically signing like a lot of American bands all at the same time to establish themselves in the US. And I think they signed, I don't know, they signed like 12 American bands or something like that yeah. all at the same time. And, um, and uh, it was just perfect timing for us. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know how Jonathan from the Flanser kind of knew that this was happening, but it was totally his idea. Yeah, and some he, kind he of insider info that this was going on, probably, and, and yeah, thought of you guys as a good fit for the label, yeah. also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, and so the experience has been cool so far. Totally. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And hopefully, it will also give you, you know. You talked about you like reconnecting with European metal and sort of mm -hmm. finding those contacts and those, you know, links in the European scene that you really, in my opinion, should have been, should have had back when uh, Maudlin was around, you know, and so mm -hmm. hopefully that mm -hmm. will, will create opportunities for you guys as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm going to spend a lot of energy, you know, kind of like thinking about my relationship to that. I mean, I, I also did with Blasphemy and I, I tried to kind of take advantage of those connections, but the pandemic kind of ruined it. So, well, there you guys were sort of screwed yeah. over, right? You even had to cut the tour short, right? For uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were out on tour in the U.S. and we had to come home halfway through. And, mm. Yeah, and then. Well, ooh. I'm yeah. I'm. I think that's you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of musicians experienced stuff like that, and and I I think also a lot of bands sort of. If not, they if they didn't fall apart, then at least sort of their their motivation fell apart a bit, and 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 so I'm glad to mm -hmm. see you out with new music, uh, even though you know this has been going on for almost two years mm -hmm. now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the kind of motivation fell apart for um, for Kaoda in 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 many ways. Yeah. Um, for like for one one thing, for example, is that you know I couldn't for making the new record, I couldn't get together with the guys that were on blasphemy so it's like the lineup changed yeah. that's one and i don't even really know what what those guys are all doing with their time right now yeah because we all live in different states so it's like who knows and then the other thing was that um you know we basically decided together as a band you know that lineup we're like you know maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't do any more live shows for yeah. a long time yeah because uh because you know kodot has existed for 18 years mm. And, um, you know, we've had ups and downs and we've had, we've had like good moments. We've had some years that were good. And then we had some years where we're doing DIY shows again and like having to play for door deals and have nobody come to the show. And it's really all just about the community that you have at the time. And, uh, you know, it's about like who your booking agent is and, mm. and how, how much they hook you up and all sorts of things like that. And, um, and we're like, yeah, we've been around 18 years and we shouldn't be in this situation where um, we're playing DIY shows and like for, for like, you know, hundred bucks and yeah, stuff exactly. like, you know, it's like, we're, we're just like, we're just not going to do it. It just pisses everybody off. And, it, you know, we need to respect ourselves more than this. So we basically just said, we're not going to play any more live shows mm -hmm. until people really care. And like, Something we get some changes. good offers. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody comes to us and is like, "Oh, you know, can you please play this awesome festival?" Then we'll be like, yeah. "Hell yeah!" And then, like, then we'll play and, it and we'll yeah. do a tour. And but we'll pay you what you what you're worth for once, right? So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that, but it's sadly it's a story I hear a lot from musicians like on the fringe of you know more you know the more interesting music is the less you know easy it seems to be to find your your position within. A scene mm -hmm. or whatever and uh you know so but but i hope that the the opportunity will arrive for you guys to go out uh on tour again thank or, you or, yeah because i'm yeah it would be yeah it would be horrible not touring. to be able to see it ko dot live you. again so yeah oh yeah i love touring and i love i love playing but i i just think that 
I just think that like for the kind of like greater health of it, yeah. um, it's better to, uh, to just wait for yeah. a better opportunity. And I think um, also, right, like you yeah. were saying, you need to have a strong motivation. You need to have a very strong sense of self-worth to be able to put up with that, right? Right. To, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, you know, I have other music that I play, so I can I can still go on tour in a kind of like DIY, kind of chill, casual context with my other stuff. But because of Ko Dot's like age, yeah. you know, it, it's it's like yeah, you can't do it with that. Of I do with my newer projects. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, that's that's a good segue because I, I wanted to ask you a bit about some of your other projects. You know, you you mm. and that this goes back to the start of the interview where you mentioned New Age. You released an album also this year uh, with uh, uh, a project called Alora Crucible. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of the <laughs> of the album, but it surprised <laughs> yeah, me. And it's like, it, it's like yeah. nightmare in Norwegian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, it surprised me. It delighted me. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's very atmospheric, new age like, uh, clean guitars, waves of keyboards. There's some violins in there. How did yeah. this music come to be? Um, okay, the the title is Thymia Mata. Sorry, Timiyamata Ascension. <laughs> so it's a, just a, a portmanteau word of, of Timiyama or Timiyamata, which is um, which means incense, and then mm-hmm. Ascension, which is yes, rising. Course, so it's rising, like yeah. the ri- it's like the rising of incense oh. smoke. And uh, and I tried to make some of the music kind of sound like that, especially the first song. It's supposed to kind of sound like incense smoke rising. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, this album came about just because I. Um, you know, I, uh, in the pandemic, I had to move back to my uh, hometown, mm-hmm. um, and being back in my hometown inspired uh, while well, doing Modern of the Well in in the context that it was done in 1996, which is ah, interesting. Yeah, and then and then also being my hometown reminded me that I that I really loved New Age at, at that age, and uh, and that you know around where I'm from, there's a lot of forests, and I would spend a lot of time just in nature. And I didn't really ever have that in New York city. Of course. Uh, and, I, and in, in New York city, it's like, I forgot about nature for 15 years. Yeah. And, uh, and then be- being back here, I remembered it. And, um, and then the pandemic had just started and everyone was like extremely in fear all the time and stressed out and the tour had just been canceled. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I didn't really want to listen to any abrasive loud music. And I just wanted to kind of listen to chill stuff. So I, yeah. I started listening to New Age again and uh, a lot of relaxing music. And I had these songs that I'd been working on for the past year before that. Um, that then I, at that moment, I understood. I was like, oh, I can actually turn these songs into New Age songs. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and then, and then did that. And then I did the violin with, with Timba Harris over email because it was an entire pandemic situation, you know. Mm. Um, and... Um, and Timba Harris, the violinist, uh, he, we've collaborated a lot of times. He played in Secret Chiefs three with me, and oh yeah, uh, so we have a, we have some really really good chemistry. Um, so um, yeah, and then um, and then fortunately, like it was able to come out on this really awesome label. And um, yeah, th- yeah, that's on the House of Mythology, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So so that's yeah. also linked back to some of those old, uh, you know, like Ulve exactly. and uh, yeah. I know it's just kind of amazing how how it all kind of is coincidentally hmm. coalescing at the same time in in that direction. And I even I even have been thinking about moving to Europe for some time hmm. um, to take advantage not just of the the Euro metal thing, but just of uh, just you know other other kind of like elements of live music and arts uh, arts support, which we don't really have in the U.S. Yes, and things like that. So um, I've been thinking about that for a while, and. Um, tried to like apply for some artist residencies in yep. Germany and things like that, but I didn't get any of them. So then I think I kind of changed my plan. I don't really know what I'm doing with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you would keep at it because it's, it's, you know, it's possible. And like you say, there's like in France here, there's a lot of pos- possible support you can get to be a, 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 an artist and, and I'm mm. all other, like in Norway where I'm from, it's, it's the same, you know, so I, I would mm. say that that, I hope you don't give up on that plan. That could be something that could could work well, work out mm-hmm. well for you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, I, I first thought of it when I was on tour in 2016. I was on a solo tour, and um, 
just having a really like terrible time in my mm-hmm. life. And, um, and I would, you know, and I was on tour in Europe and the, and it was just like this kind of, uh, intense, you know, it was for my record Madonna horror and that music is so bleak yeah, yeah. and sad yeah. and, um, and just every day we're playing like this sad, slow, depressing, emotional music. And, and it was the middle of the winter and just the, the vibe was so crushing. <laughs> and, um, and we played in Portugal and one of my Portuguese friends said, um, you know, you really should stay here. Mm. And I can't believe he said, he said, I can't believe you haven't moved to Europe mm. by now because, you know, you're always complaining about how hard it is for you. And I see you on Facebook complaining. Mm. And he's like, you know, that like, if you just move to Europe, it's not going to be like that. And you'll have, you'll have lots of opportunities to play your, your cool music. And he even offered to hook me up with like a little residency in yeah. Porto. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, yeah. And I, I really thought about doing it. And I, I really don't know why I didn't, <laughs> you know, um, I'm, but I'm, I should, I should have. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not going to sit there and say that it's easy in Europe, but I do think like you say, that there is a bigger scene. There's a bigger, um, you know, community. And there's also a bigger support for yeah. music that it's outside sort of the, the more commercial music. So, so, you know, don't don't give up on that. I would love to see <laughs> yeah. you over here, uh, just out of you know my own e- egoistical <laughs> as uh, well. You know, to be able to see more uh, of your music live it would probably be possible if you you lived over here. Do you think there will be, that? Like, yeah. Do you think there will be an, Do you think there will be another uh, Alora Crucible album? Uh, is that something yeah, you? I, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I. I'm I've, I'm already in the stages of planning the next one, but I'm I'm waiting until uh, a new instrument arrives. I got like a hammer dulcimer, um, but uh, Ooh. but it hasn't really it hasn't arrived yet. Um, yeah. I'm because I'm getting it kind of like custom built. So, um, but yeah, we're gonna do one that's more like a little bit closer to the acoustic spectrum instead hmm. of instead of so much synths. Yeah. Um, and I uh, do you know this. Uh, I think there's Swedish band called Grupa. It's kind of yeah. like Swedish folk. Or they're no. Norwegian, but they're okay. Swedish. No. Yeah, yeah. You know what no. I'm talking about? No, yeah. I, no, don't really. I don't really oh, okay. uh, know, know them. But you have to okay, send, yeah. send me a link after this because I'm interested now. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send you a link. They're they're basically like a kind of like fo- sort of like folk, but kind of new age. Okay. Um, hmm. not really, I'm not really sure what we would call them, but it's like super, super beautiful. Hmm. And um, and I I found out about them a couple of years ago and I've just been thinking about like how to do that kind of thing with my own identity. And, um, and I was also, uh, you know, I said this on another uh, podcast recently, but I, I've been thinking a lot about the apocalypse and about how, about how all the music that I've played in the past requires electricity. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I really should, I really should like kind of get more into acoustic instruments mm-hmm. just in case I don't have access to electricity. Wow. That's a, a bleak. <laughs> that's a bleak thought, you know. But I agree with you. Of course, if we're not having yeah. some kind of weird Mad Max like uh, apocalypse, then there will be no like no electric instruments, right? If that's yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but that's that's but, interesting. I I I also I, I I was interested to hear about the the dulcimer, you know, uh, mm. I, because I was I re- I just thought about one of your label mates on the Flenser, you know, the band called mm. Botanist. Who does yeah. this uh, with the dulcimer? I I don't think I've heard that used much in this type of music outside of that. So yeah, mm. I don't think that I would electrify mine no. the way that they do. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I I think I would let it be like very very natural, like the type of sound that you could. I could take the instrument out to the forest and not have to have an amplifier. And, Actually, yeah. play it just yeah. Be able to perform it without any form of uh, yeah yeah amplification. Yeah, oh. but I do love man that last botanist record. I I thought it was amazing. Me too. And yeah, it was really really like everybody everybody totally ignored it, <laughs> and it's too bad because it was it was their best one, and it was yeah. proggy. You know, it was like super great. Very very much so. Yeah, very much yeah. so. Progressive in the true sense of the word, I would say. But they have always been that. So that's just mm-hmm. like you guys, really. That that uh, you know a band that that does progressive stuff in music and and yeah very very interesting mm. yeah i'm glad yep. to hear there's mm. going to be more music from 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 that project as well and uh, mm. can we also talk about blood mist <laughs> yes <laughs> you you released an uh, an album last year right uh called fos fos yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah so can we yeah. expect some more music from blood mist 
yeah, we recorded um, we recorded a new one already. We actually oh, did it. Um, we did it last November, a year ago almost. Huh. And um, even though it was the middle of the pandemic, we had hmm. this opportunity to do um, to to get together because um, Jeremiah, the clarinetist in that band, he got uh, he got like an artist residency, and we had access to this huge space to do it in. So we recorded one in New York, um, yeah, last November, and have just been kind of thinking about putting it out, but it's, it's finished, you know, it's, it's ready, but, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really know exactly like how, because there's all these vinyl delays and things yeah, like that. That's very much. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's probably going to come out in a couple months. That's also very different to some of the other music you make. Yeah. What, 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 what are some mm-hmm. of the like inspirations or, or that you, when you put together the music for, for blood mist? Well, it, it's just free improvisation. Yeah. So, um, and, and, you know, since I don't have very much of a, a background as an improviser and I'm like more a composer, um, my inspiration for Blood Mist is this Norwegian band called Super Silent. Oh, you know these guys? Well, yes, of course. Yeah. That's you know, uh, the band. Uh, well, they were used to, they were called the Vestlefrik before they went into being called Super Silent. It's like oh, yeah, a yeah. yeah Norwegian jazz trio or yeah. Yeah, something very yeah. very good band yeah I, I I love that band and I and I I'm pretty sure it's free improvisation but it's it's yeah. kind of like produced in a way that You're sounds right. like just amazing amazing writing and um I just I and it's pretty they're pretty dark you know I think anyway very much so yeah. and um I so I just I just love them so much so when I when I perform as an improviser I think about kind of like constructing and, and constructing an improvised composition maybe the way that they would do it yeah and um and that's my take on on what i try to do in blood mist and then um and then obviously the other guys have their own backgrounds so you know they they do their own thing and then we have a lot of chemistry because we've been friends and collaborators for a long time and then it it ends up being this unique thing Mm. and yeah the next one that we're going to put out is um is definitely the best one for sure well that 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 bodes well because i i love the last one so i'm i'm very eager to hear what you guys do next you know it's very amazing it's like that's the, that's the kind of music that really takes you you know out of yourself in a way <laughs> because it is very you know yeah it flows in a way that's very very interesting to listen to so yeah i'm really glad you're interested in it because you know how i was telling you that i kind of want to be on hiatus live with Kota until yeah until the shows are really good um so uh because of because of that and because i have more of my energy freed up to do other bands yeah um the blood me and the blood mist guys have been talking about how we want to spend a lot more of our energy playing more with blood mist of course so, yeah and that's yeah. a band also probably that would suit going live on stage very well right and it would be unique to, experiences every time yeah we get to see you guys on, on stage so yeah, that's, yeah yeah and and you know just uh you know we get better and better and better every time we play because Oh, since course. it's fr- since yeah. it's free improvisation we build our chemistry and it's it's like you can you can kind of just witness the the chemistry just increasing and increasing and mm. increasing you know uh we're drawing towards the end and, and there's just so much <laughs> music and it's almost impossible to cover everything with you but mm-hmm. can i just ask you about never gonna happen for me that's yeah. probably some of the most heartbreaking music i've ever heard <laughs> Please tell me about that track and and will that yeah. is that some is that style something you would like to explore further? Yeah, um, yeah. I so you know you you mentioned Allura Crucible and how it's a new age record and yeah. you know one of the reasons why it's not called the Toby Driver record is because the style is different and it's mm. not really balladry. Yeah. Uh, but I do but I do like writing songs and I like writing sad ballads and and if I did another record that was like sad ballads it would be called. Toby Driver and it, yeah, it's it's fun to make mm. that music, but it's also extremely emotionally draining because I can imagine uh, yeah. because it's just it's just sad, you know. Yeah. Um, so that song, um, I I recorded that song. Um, it was a de- it was December 2019, and it was uh, a few months after Blasphemy came out. Yeah, and um, we also uh, Kota had done this this tour for like a couple months right after Blast Me came out and it was pretty shitty. And um and it was winter here, you know, and winter is always like really depressing for me. Is, so that that song was basically just, you know, it's basically about how like 
the things that I want are not going to work out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, and, and, you know, blasphemy, like didn't, didn't really, you know, didn't really like help KO dot grow at all. And that's really, that's really depressing. And yeah. um, Yeah. So it was, I was, and also I had released a solo record uh, that, that I was very proud of. The year before that, yes, of and of course, like, a fantastic. Uh... Yeah, and like nothing happened with that, and I was just like, man, like, it, like no matter what I do, it, it has it has yeah. nothing to do with like how good the music, the is work is, or, or, or yeah, how exactly. much yeah. or how much of my soul I put into it. Like, it's still the barriers are all um, industry barriers, mm. <laughs> and it's just yeah, it's just sad. So yeah, it's just yeah that that's you know that song. The the lyrics of that song are about jumping in front of the subway. And um, something very dark, but fortunately, if I make a song that's about that, then yeah. it, hel- it helps me not actually do that. <laughs> it sort of it sort of gets it out of your system to be able to yeah. put it down on. Yeah. Well, you also yeah. you also of course mentioned uh, your your uh, solo solo album. You know, they are the shield, which was also yeah. a beautiful album. And thank you. Hopefully, there's also going to be more. Toby Driver under the name Toby Driver music coming coming up right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not writing anything right now, um, but like I said, I I do enjoy writing songs and I yeah. I really enjoy singing. So um, yeah, I I will. But I actually don't feel bad right now, and um, <laughs> I'm glad I, like to I'm, hear I, it. I, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm actually like pretty happy right now. So. Um, that that Toby Driver ballad, those sad ballads, like they they really come out when I'm feeling bad. I see. And yeah, yeah like the, like that song we were just talking about. Yeah. Um. And uh, you know, since I since I feel fine right now, I don't think I no. need those songs to come out. Uh, creativity is channeled into other av- avenues or whatever. When you yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, finally, I want to say you know we talked about uh, Ko dot. Have you guys? Uh, Maybe are on somewhat of a hiatus with playing live or whatever. But what's next for you? Do do you hope to? You talked about getting out there and, and playing again. Do you have any yeah. you know any plans for getting out and playing now that uh, the pandemic is slowly slowly winding down? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually have some solo shows with the Laura Crucible. There's going to be four in France, one in Belgium, and four in the UK, and that's going to be in March. Oh, really? Yeah. Well. That, um, I, I that I'm looking forward to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Follow me on Facebook, and I'll I'll announce it. But yeah, I didn't announce it yet. But um, but once we just like get all the confirmations and s- oh, stuff like that, I'm very we'll, glad we'll to announce that. it. Yeah. 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 And then and then I'm playing bass for some of my friends' bands this winter. Okay. Uh, yeah. and and then I'm working on a commission for um a classical ensemble with a um a chimbalum, which is kind of like hammer dulcimer. So it's like. Coincidentally, I have this hammer bilsmer and this chimbalo at the same time. So, yeah, yeah, well. yeah. I'm doing stuff like that, and then you know, of course, I hope ideally. Like, I mean, I love playing loud metal and yelling a lot. So, if I hope that Moss Grew does well and people are interested, and then yeah. we get some offers, and then KO will be able to play some loud shows. That'll I hope really so fun. too. <laughs> I hope there will be opportunity for some of the festivals here that are interested in you know i know you played roadburn uh several times but there are of course yeah. other festivals in europe here that focus on progressive and experimental and avant-garde music and i hope there might be a chance for to see you you guys play there yeah thank you yeah and i also thought that maybe like moss grew like i to, to me it's not actually that strange of music it's like Rel- like compared to what I other- compared to my other music, yeah. I feel like it's like kind of straightforward. So I think it it, it could even fit in at um, a, a festival a, that's just a metal festival. Exactly, a more yeah. like straight up metal festival that covers all yeah. all styles of metal or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think so. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that sort of brings us to the end of the talk. Um, of course, all you right. should you should all follow Toby and Ko Dot on their social media. I will put the links in the description. I also highly recommend you to check out Moscrew on the Swords and Plowshares alike. Uh, if you if you haven't already, you know you can listen on streaming services, or even better, purchase the album from Prophecy or from Toby's Bandcamp. It's called Chaodot and the Music of Toby Driver. Just look in the descriptions. Mm. I will put everything. Thank you so much for being on the Prog Talks with me, Toby. Yes, thank you. I had such a great talk. <laughs> I'm glad, you know, for those of you that enjoy what we're doing with the Prog Talks, as I mentioned before, we have these Bios the Coffee links. 
also a subscription, a like, helps us a lot. Until next time, stay safe and spread that prog. The Prog Talks, produced by the Prog Space. Main host, Rune Belsvik Reynos. Produced by Rune Belsvik Reynos, Vanessa and Matthias Kirsch. All graphics and animations by Vanessa Kirsch. Intro theme by Giuseppe Negri. Outro theme by Zach Munoviz. This was the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. See you in a week.